Hello, my name is uh, Grotti Roche. I'm from the uh, uh, OpenGSN team. We've done a lot of gasless, and lately we're working on a kind of abstraction with the EF, if you are from the EF. And I'm here to describe a kind of abstraction with a, a specific stress on how to build a wallet on this framework. I will go with a brief overview of what a, a kind of abstraction is, what we abstract, uh, security, uh, the architecture of uh, our implementation of uh, EIP 4337, some cool features we think can be built and should be built above it. And then I will go into the SDK we have, uh, how to use it, how to use this API to create a wallet. Uh, we do need uh, knowledge both in Solidity and Ether's API in JavaScript. I hope everybody here has it. Okay, first of all, before we do account abstraction, as I said, it's for doing for security. What is the basic account security? Uh, account security is for done, uh, does uh, three things. Uh, authentication, replay protection, and uh, DOS protection. Those gas payments we're paying, they're the mechanism used by the system uh, for DOS protection. They're not just fines. And when we say account abstraction, what we basically abstract is all of these. So we have a wallet, a wallet uh, is a contract, and the contract uh, can abstract uh, the authentication, it can do whatever it like, replace the signature, whether it can use ECDSA, it can use uh, BLS for aggregation or other things, you can do quantum resistance. Uh, we as a counter abstraction don't care what uh, signature scheme is used. It, uh, except of using different scheme, it can use it, uh, to change the signer, you're not bound to this signer address. The signer is separate from the account itself. You can use multiple signer and uh, uh, access roles, whatever, and you can do a recovery. A lot of features you can do with the uh, for authentication. For replay protection, you still need to use somehow nonce. You can use normal sequential nonces, like our sample, but if you like, you want to use parallel, that is transactions that can be sent on chain regardless of the order, you can do it also. And for payment, yes, you can do the normal payment, the account pays for itself, but we also provide an API to let an external uh, contract to perform the payment, opening uh, cool features like uh, onboarding where some external contract application pays for the deployment or uh, using token paymaster to pay with the token for uh, transactions. Uh, briefly, the components we have for account abstraction. First and foremost is the user operation. This is our transaction. The replacement for a transaction structure is user operation. We'll see it later. later. Then there's a wallet, the account, which is built, of course, from a contract. Uh, there's a sentence, uh, second contract we call the deployer. This is the contract that deploys new contract. Again, through the system. And the wallet software, the UX, we see the either uh, browser extension or other software that uh, shows the UX, the transaction to the end user and uh, let it sign the transaction. It has to know the contract signature, of course, to sign using the right signature. The next component of our system are the paymaster, the contracts that can pay for transaction if they want. Uh, that is, they verify transaction and decide whether this transaction uh, is valid for their own uh, payment system. Uh, bundlers are the nodes that support account abstraction and put these uh, user operations uh, on chain. And the entry point, this is the one contract we deliver uh, that executes on chain the transaction, perform all the validation, orchestrates all the system. Uh, if we look briefly about how we add it to the system. We have an application that uses the wallet software and send the, the RPC, but you can see here that account abstraction doesn't come to replace uh, in one shot a normal transaction. Some nodes of the system continue to work with transactions, some nodes no uh, normal transaction, but also user operation. User operations come from a separate mempool. So when a wallet sends a user operation into some nodes and bundler, it will get into uh, the network. Yes, we would like all the nodes in the system to support user uh, operations, 
in account abstraction, but the system will work fine even if only part of the nodes support it. Uh, if you look at the flow on-chain, once a node sends a user operation, there's a single method in entry point called handle ops to send a transaction. The transaction goes through four steps. First step, if needed, optional, is to create this wallet if it has an init code. It will deploy this uh, wallet contract if needed. Once it is deployed, uh, the validate user op uh, method is called. This is the main method, we'll see it later, that uh, a wallet uh, has that validates the signature, nonce, and everything, and pays if needed. If there is a paymaster, the paymaster is consulted whether it wants to uh, pay for this transaction, otherwise the transaction will be rejected. And finally, uh, the transaction will be executed on chain. And as I said, it's called handle ops. It can be a bundle, that's why we call it a bundler, with multiple ops in a single uh, request. But I will not stress on this because this is something that a wallet doesn't care about, something that the system does for its own optimizations. Uh, if we look at the transaction, the way we see it is a, an application, how, how, how we add account abstraction, how applications start to interact with it. So an application is probably stay unmodified. It uses a wallet, it will continue to use a wallet. The wallet will be modified, of course, Instead of uh, creating a transaction, it will create a user operation and uh, display it to the user with the added fields, ask the user to sign it, and eventually send it to the node through a different RPC call, the send user operation. Uh, the node bundler uh, will accept it, it verifies it, unlike normal node that knows the signature scheme and everything to check it, it, will, it makes the view call to this uh, validate user op, not directly, but it, it makes a view call to the entry point to validate this uh, user operation, and it add it to the mempool. Later on, uh, a bundler, what used to be called in the past a miner, will uh, collect all this uh, user operation from the mempool and will create a handle ops transaction and put it on chain. Okay, uh, let's see what we have in a user operation. Uh, User operation, first it has all the fields that you see for, you know, from a normal transaction. Uh, the call data itself, gas limit, uh, uh, gas uh, values, signature, uh, and nonce, except that uh, the definition of nonce and signature are completely open to the wallet implementation. Then there are some extra fields that we add. We put the sender, since we can't assume this signature is ECDSA, which you can recover the address of the sender from the signature. We have to specify the sen uh, sender address specifically. If the wallet is not yet deployed, we have the init code, which is the uh, code that is used to create this wallet. And uh, we have several extra gas fields that we have to add. We have a verification step, so we have a limit on the gas that the verification step can take. And uh, there is some gas a value that has to account for all the things that you can't check on chain, like call data cost to the, etc. Uh, and finally, there is the paymaster information. If there is a paymaster, it will be specified on the paymaster. Uh, what the wallet has uh, to define? The API we provide uh, specify the function validate user operation in the iWallet interface. This is the only function we mandate by its name, by the wallet. It receives the entire user operation, and uh, the request ID, which is basically a hash of this user operation, this is what gets signed, and uh, it needs to uh, validate the signature. An aggregator, not relevant for this talk, it's for a separate talk about uh, signature aggregation, highly relevant for L2s, not relevant uh, at the moment. And uh, missing wallet funds, this is the top-up value the wallet has to pay. If no one else pays, and there is no balance that it already has, it has to pay this to the entry point for this uh, transaction to succeed. If this uh, valid user op reverts, the transaction will fail. It will not pay anything. 
Uh, if it succeeds, then uh, later on, uh, the entry point will call the call data. Uh, there are two wallet-specific uh, wallet functions. We don't mandate their name, but uh, the wallet has to provide them. One of them is nonce to return the current nonce value. When we create a transaction, we need to know the current nonce. And the other is the method that will be executed from the entry point. So in our sample wallet, we call it exec from entry point, which I think is a good name. Uh, it, ha it has to have implementations for these two methods. Um, okay, now I'm going to the uh, client side. I want to create a transaction. I need to have a wallet, but today we don't have a wallet that supports account abstraction. So we created a method where we can use an existing uh, uh, injected wallet, like MetaMask, and still use the uh, account abstraction uh, with it. Um, what we do is uh, we, we take uh, the current, we, we take your uh, ethos provider, the current provider you have, we uh, have an API to wrap it with the account abstraction specific provider. When you send a transaction through this provider, it will go through the logic of a create a user operation for it and to send it uh, on chain. So if you add this code to your client application, it will go through a account abstraction. One thing that is missing here is that you see we have the wallet address. Uh, this wallet address exists even before the wallet itself is uh, deployed on chain. Uh, the wallet is able to uh, pay for itself for its own creation, so we need to fund it to send some ETH into this address, or if you use a paymaster, the paymaster can uh, handle uh, this uh, payment. But this address, the signer address of our provider, this is the address of the uh, wallet itself. And then I create a it as a contract and call some method, and the method will get called. And the first time the wallet is called, this method will also create the contract. The difference from a normal wallet, yes, it will take a little more gas because you need to deploy this uh, contract just before making the call. Uh, this is the high-level API. Underneath this API, we provide the, we call a base wallet API. This is the API that let you create user operation. We pass the parameter to it. It will create uh, the user operation, but creating user operation is uh, highly dependent on the contract. So this ba uh, base wallet API, which is an abstract class, provides uh, four uh, abstract methods. Uh, how to create an init code for this specific wallet, uh, a method to sign, uh, the get nonce. This is the method that reads from uh, a view call from the on-chain value of the current nonce, and a method to create the execution function uh, to make this call. And uh, in our sample uh, contract, we have a contract we call a simple wallet. So we created a simple wallet API. It, it uses this uh, base, uh, base wallet API and implement it for our uh, contract, the above four methods. So you create a simple wallet API, uh, and then you can call it uh, to create a transaction, sign tra or unsigned tra transaction, and uh, then send it on chain. The owner we see here, also on the base class, uh, is a signer. This is the, the owner of the wallet, which is the the class will be get called to sign the, this uh, user operation. Uh, okay, if you have any question, I can go back. Yes.
Okay, when, when you create a simple wallet API, a specific wallet API, it is for a specific instance. You can pass it here the address. I didn't specify if it is pre-configured, you can pass here the, also the address of the wallet contract itself. Uh, the API as I call it here is, it is not yet created, so I create this object, I specify the, sign, the owner, the signer, and I have get a wallet address, I have a method here to get the address of my wallet, which will probably the one I will use on the next call. Yes, the sample here shows only the first creation. For an already created wallet, yes, you will specify the address of the wallet, obviously. Also, you can have, it is possible uh, to add account abstraction support for an existing wallet. Like we have an example how to take Ignosis safe and to add it interface to be called through account abstraction. So obviously, you if you didn't create it this way, you have the address of the wallet. It is not created through the system, but once it is created, you can use it as your address. Yes, both here and the, the high-level API, you can specify the address of the wallet. Sender. It, it is called sender. It is called sender because sender is the contract that will call the call data. Call data is the encoded call. So if I, and I will call it on the sender, so I'd like to call it a wallet. Okay, it's the same. The wallet is the same. The na naming is problematic, yes. What do you mean to change the parameters? Yes. Yes. We don't. You can have what, whatever you like. I think the best way to do it is make a transaction that you, as the owner of this smart uh, contract, makes to make some changes. You can have an API that will use only through entry point, but if you want to call it directly, for example, you don't want to use for one transaction, you want that the owner can also call directly this contract. Then you will want, you will want that to change owner, change entry point, all these functions will be callable the same way. So this is the way we suggest to do it. You as an owner allowed to make, execute from this yeah, yes, yes. smart contract and also make changes on itself. Yeah. So. Yeah, so uh, I think the the normal flow for reconfiguring whatever whatever type of reconfiguration you want to do, whether it's to set a new entry point or even let's say it's a multi-sig and you want to add a signer, then the the correct way to do it will be through a user operation where uh, in the call data you can specify you can, in, it's actually a self call. The wallet is calling itself, so it will still go through the same uh, validation flow. Validate your validate user op implementation gets called. And then after the wallet says, yeah, I accept this uh, sign, I accept this operation, and then it will be executed on the wallet. So we don't, uh, we, uh, we don't mandate which, uh, there's no interface for what other, fu what, uh, what other functions the wallet needs to implement. You can have an exit function. You can also have configuration functions. But you should make sure that they can only be called by the wallet itself or by entry point, depending on the model you use, not by anything else. Any more questions? For what? Yes, it's uh, you. You would have to uh, you would have to deploy if you wanted to have the same address. Then you would have to deploy. You would uh, you would have to send the first transaction on each of the chains, which would deploy the wallet. 
Uh, if you use the provider, then uh, this is uh, transparent to the user. It just gets deployed. But uh, the caveat is that, uh, all, that uh, both of the chains need to have uh, the deployer in the same address in order for the created wallet to also have the same, uh, the same address. It's um, yeah. It's done uh, since uh, it's all counterfactual. You can start uh, so you can assume that you own the address. Uh, you can assume that you own the address. You can even send assets to it without having the contracts, and then uh, the contract gets created the first time you transact with it. It's so it's created lazily or optimistically when when you need to uh, start using it. It's actually it's it's actually the way the way you're supposed to do it because the wallet is supposed to pay unless there is a paymaster involved. So uh, putting the paymaster use case aside, the wallet needs to pay for its own creation. So uh, so you need to have uh, so you need to have some ETH inside the wallet uh, inside the wallet address before the wallet even exists. You send ETH to the address before uh, after getting the wallet address. And then when it gets deployed, the first thing it's going to do is during, the, during its validation, it will pay for its own creation. And if it doesn't, then the creation gets reverted. Yes, and if you want to use it uh, cross-chain, uh, as a wallet uh, creator, you have to make sure that the uh, deployer contract is the same on all the chains, and this way it will create the counterfactual address for this signer will be the same on all networks. Yes. We don't mandate how to use it, but yet it has to be deterministic. As you have said, the wallet can't pay for its own creation unless you as a wallet creator can counterfactually know the address and put funds into it. So if you look at the high level API, you see I, I use normal ethers uh, code. I, I created our provider. The signer in our provider, uh, it's not a real signer, it's the component that sends it, uh, it's a user operation, but it has that method, get address. In normal uh, account, it is the account address, which is really the signer. In our case, it will return the counterfactual address that you can use to send funds to. But again, it depends on the deployer that will work. Yes, we provide a sample deployer that is counterfactual, that is, creates the address exactly based on the uh, Basically, it means that the, the deployer has to create the address based on the current signer. The first signer you are using, you have the signer, uh, uh, the component that will sign this, uh, will create an old, uh, in the next request of this uh, wallet. Uh, and based on the deployer itself and this uh, address, you, uh, we create the address of the uh, wallet. If you later change the address, it doesn't matter because uh, then you will al already have the address and you will keep the same address. You don't care. The counterfactual address is only needed for the initial creation. Sorry? Ah. No, 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 sorry, go on. Create two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so uh, this is not a this is not a hard fork. It's an ERC, meaning that uh, we need uh, we need some bundler to support it. And ideally, it would be great if all nodes uh, support it, if all block builders support it. But uh, we can start without it. So uh, we are starting a network of uh, we are starting a network of uh, of uh, bundlers, and we hope it will uh, it will expand over time because uh, it's going to be profitable for block builders. So when a block builder when a block builder uh, includes such a bundle in the transaction, uh, the block builder gets paid for it. So block builders are incentivized to uh, participate in this mempool and include uh, these operations. It it won't happen in a, in a one day, but it's okay. It can uh, it can happen over time. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Right now, right now there's an implementation of a, a nethermine that is a full-fledged node. Uh, it's currently on the Gurley network. 
Uh, we have our own bundler. Uh, it's somewhat limited. From a wallet perspective, it's uh, fully functional. It receives a user operation RPC and it puts them on chain. From the bundler's perspective, uh, it can be a DOSable, it can be a attacked. The large part of the ERC uh, are made to how to make this uh, network of bundlers resilient. Our specific bundler, it's simple, but it's not as resilient as it should. We're working yeah, on it right. with Nethermind and others. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ideally. Grab this, uh, right. Yeah. This, uh, functionality mm -hmm. in, in general. Yeah, ideally it should be ideally it should be part of uh, nodes. Whatever, when any node that is used for block building uh, has the information in order to uh, in order to also uh, build uh, these bundles. And uh, as Dro mentioned, uh, there's a, so Nethermind Nethermind implemented it in their own client, and there is also and they also implemented it into MEV into MEV Geth. So there's actually a Geth fork that also uh, uh, that also supports this. And uh, we hope that we hope to see a lot more of those. And uh, another way you can currently uh, you can currently run a bundle uh, safely is by having it uh, is by connecting it to Flashbots or to MEV Boost, so that uh, so you know that uh, you cannot be you cannot be attacked in certain ways because uh, you can use the protection granted by uh, Flashbots to submit the bundle. I think we provide the censorship position resistance that the normal Ethereum nodes uh, gets. It's a mempool, and uh, nodes take entries from the mempool that are profitable and put them on chain. Uh, anyone, you have actually another layer that if you have a specific uh, application, you can easily run your own uh, bundler. You know you will not attack itself, uh, because in order to be protected, the bundler has to make view call to make sure it, it will succeed and they make the transaction. So a uh, general purpose bundler cannot trust uh, components not to front run itself. But if it is your bundler, you can always trust it. So you, can, you have a way to uh, make always your transaction. But uh, for a general use, I believe it is as censorship resistant as nodes at the Ethereum network. Yeah, but there's actually, there you actually have a fallback, uh, but you actually, as a last line of defense, let's say all the bundlers decide to censor you, then, uh, and you're not running a bundler and everything, you can always just put a bundle yourself. Since the bundle itself is just an Ethereum transaction, so if you have an EOA with gas, you can use it to submit. Uh, you can you can use it to act as a one-time bundler and put your you put your bundle on chain. So it is a, it is it is always as censorship resistant as Ethereum itself. It has some gas. Is it cheap? It has some overhead. Yes, the overhead of the system is. 20 or 30K, 20K on top of the normal uh, 21K. It's not a big deal. You will lose because it, it's not a bundle. You will send a bundle of one, so you can't split it with others, or if you do have, you can. It's less than a single uh, unit of operation on the other. This is the simplest way to do it. It is possible to manage multiple addresses, but uh, it's going to be very difficult to manage. Yes, th in order to be person, you want to have the same address. Okay, first, it's not a problem with account, account abstraction itself. It's a, it's a use case that you want to support it. We do see ways that you can use the same address on multiple chains. All it requires is that you put the same deployer on all chains and then you have it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this deployer can be deployed using Create Tool, using some counterfactual deployers that are out there, or using your account. Like the deployer of Gnosis 8 is deployed by their own private key on all chains. So they can will always be able to support their new chains. So you can use that method. Once you use it, you have a mechanism to have the same address on all chains. Mm -hmm. But technically, if you, are, if you are on chains where you can't have the same address, I can see a use case, for example, for having a registrar. Like, you know, having, suppose you have a singleton contract where on the chain where you, where you initially create a wallet, you could have a mapping. Uh, you could have a mapping that says uh, you can send it from a certain wallet. And um, OK. Yeah. So you could build solutions around it. Yes, yeah, so we, we added support for a signature aggregation, mostly for BLS, and we have a reference implementation of BLS using it. Uh, the idea is that you send a, a, bun, uh, a bundle of uh, multiple user operation, but with empty signature in all of them. As long as they use the same aggregator, you have a single aggregated signature. Uh, and there is a yet another contract that you have to use, which is called a signature aggregator you interact with. If you want to go deeply, I can, we can talk about it later. Right now, it is not deployed anywhere. There's a sample that works with it, but uh, we didn't go and make any further progress with it yet. Yeah, but... Uh, it, is, it is only valid for L2s, because there is a requirement that the cost of aggregating a single signature is uh, less in a, on Ethereum, the cost of pairing, aggregating a single signature of BLS is more expensive than a, a EC Recover. So there's no point of using it on any chain that uh, with the, the, gas, with the uh, L1 gas uh, limits. On L2s, where there is a huge gap between cold data cost, which is very expensive, and uh, CPU, data, CPU gas cost, which is very low, there it makes sense very much uh, to be used. Yeah, I think uh, I think we are a bit over time, so uh, we can continue to take uh, questions. Uh, sorry, if you want to, uh, if you want to keep discussing it. Okay. Uh,